As a student, I thought I'd be a poet or a painter. Yet instead, I spent seven years in the Pentagon, which is the mothership of the US Department of Defense, in that great killer of poetic ambition, the windowless office, in a basement for seven years. It's a wonder I didn't come out looking like Gollum. Uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about, about how I got there and what I learned. In the summer of 2001, I was given a fellowship as a reward for my studies. It took me all over the world. In South Africa, my first stop, I met the amazing woman that would become my wife. We hiked wide open terrain. We talked about how we each wanted to make a difference. And then, a few months after we met, we found ourselves huddled around her small black and white television, watching as the World Trade Center fell and war came to the United States. The events of 9-11 comprise what the British sociologist Anthony Giddens refers to as high consequence risks. Such events could be wars, a terrorist attack, even the disruption caused by climate change. We know that such events will happen. Recall, if you will, the ancient bustling city of Pompeii, here one day and gone the next. These events are disruptive, transformative parts of the human experience. But in modernity, as Giddens argues, our reliance on technology, our dense urban populations, and our global interdependence on global systems makes us more vulnerable to smaller attacks that can have an impact disproportionate to their size. High consequence risks. They change our perceptions of the world. They change our perceptions of ourselves. And indeed, they alter life trajectories and the course of nations. So the question becomes, how do we prevent them from occurring? And when they do occur, how do we withstand them? And it's not a question of if, but when, because we know they will happen. Nowhere is this question more salient today than with the internet. Our reliance on cyberspace stands in stark contrast to the inadequacy of our cybersecurity. We are vulnerable to disruptive attacks, we're behind in making our investments, and we are unprepared in an attack if an attack gets through. So today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about how to fix that problem and how to withstand a cyber attack. But first, I wanna look at why the internet presents itself as such a high consequence risk. Do we really have such a need to be worried? Should I be so anxious? Remember in the 1990s, that first email that you send out. Oh my God, mom, dad, I'm online. This is amazing. Hello, how are you? Ah. Fast forward 20 years, right? The internet is an engine of innovation and wonder. Size, Gangnam style. Seen by 2.5 billion people, right? The ease of online banking. How Uber and Grab Taxi let you book a cab with just one click. When I entered the Obama administration in 2009, I was focused on counter-extremism. But I soon learned that the global economy was being taken apart piece by piece by cyber-enabled espionage. Not only that, but we were vulnerable to disruptive and destructive attacks on our infrastructure. Imagine for a moment, you woke up this morning, you go into the shower, you turn on the water, there's no water that comes out, right? You can't brush your teeth. So you go to work, a little smelly, only to learn that hackers tied to an extremist group had penetrated the pipelines that, bring, that brings water from the Lingua Reservoir in Johar, Malaysia, into Singapore. That's 250 million gallons of water per year. The attack disrupted the pipeline and prevented water from coming in. This is an imagined scenario, but it's something that confront government and industry leaders all over the world every day. Code, like us, is vulnerable to manipulation. It used to be that to strike at another country, you had to have a ship, a wooden ship, or a plane, or a missile. But today, with 3.3 billion users online, you can use the platform of the internet to reach out from one corner of the world, even from your, your basement or your bedroom, and target another actor on the opposite side of the world. This has profound implications for international security, right? The thing is, destructive attacks are not just the domain of science fiction or action films. They've already occurred. In 2012, a hostile actor targeted the networks and systems of Saudi Aramco, one of the world's largest oil companies. They destroyed 30,000 hard drives, forcing employees to revert to faxing and typewriting 
to continue business transactions. The attack did not disrupt oil production, nor did it impact the global markets for the global oil markets, but it could have with a few additional steps. This would be analogous to striking at the shipping industry in Singapore. Imagine if someone broke into the data that allows you to track all of those containers on top of that ship such that all of the data disappeared. This could have a pronounced impact on the market, right? Here's another example. In 2014, the actors uh, Seth Rogen and James Franco produced a film, The Interview, a fictional account of the pretend assassination of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. North Korea learned of the attack and threatened reprisals if it was released, which these threats are promptly dismissed. Then a few weeks before the film was set to be released, the FBI learned that a group calling itself the Guardians of Peace had hacked into Sony's networks, taken emails from the leadership, put them online, and destroyed data. Right? FBI then attributed the attack to North Korea, who denied it. But then the Guardians of Peace threatened violence against American citizens who went to see the film. This was a dangerous escalation by a nuclear-armed country. President Obama declared that the attack was unacceptable and that the United States would respond in a time, manner, and place of its choosing. A few weeks later, the U.S. government sanctioned the North Korean regime. These are just two examples of destructive attacks. There are also non-state groups. Anonymous, we know, seeks to acquire destructive capabilities. ISIS is trying to recruit cyber warriors to its jihad and to acquire destructive capabilities. Imagine these, these attacks that I just named happened during peacetime. During wartime, the effect could be so much worse. We are at a crossroads in our story with cybersecurity. At this moment, we have not seen major attacks during a conflict. Imagine, however, during a declared conflict or a war, that a state unleashes all of its cyber capabilities on something like the electric grid in the United States or industries within Singapore. The effects could be pronounced. That's one possible future. What's the second future? That's one where a culture of cybersecurity takes root such that our most important missions, operations, and infrastructure are secured. And we become resilient to attack. So how do we get there? First, let me describe to you a few of the stakeholders in this space. I'll start, these are mostly American examples because that's where I come from. So within the US government, my old employer, the US Department of Defense, in 2012, identified three major missions for the department, the first of which is to defend its own networks. Now, we have 3.2 million people within the Defense Department, so there are a lot of networks, and a lot of them are very important. The decision was made that we needed to build and invest for 6,200 people and all of their technical capabilities to form the cyber team at US Cyber Command. Initially, the military was very hesitant to allowing all these people to be drawn from other missions because it was during a period of budgetary drawdown and it was going to be expensive. To sustain this force over time is expensive. But eventually, all the admirals, all the generals, and all the leadership in the department got on board and said, yes, we have to invest. Other agencies within the government are very, that are investing a lot are the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. These are both significant investments. So what about you know, within the private sector, the banking industry has invested a lot. It's been in the news lately. We know that financial systems are very vulnerable. They have to invest. So they've led the way in terms of cybersecurity investments. What about in the private sector more broadly? Let's just look at a couple of groups here. So the first would be the IT companies, Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Akamai. They're doing a whole bunch of things that are very important for cybersecurity. I'll just name two things. First, their software drives so much of cyberspace. So what they need to do is they need to drive down vulnerabilities within their systems. So they spend a lot of time looking for vulnerabilities and trying to close them. That's a major part of what they do to secure their own system. A second thing that they do is they enable, they enable cybersecurity solutions for the users. These could be for individuals or for companies. One thing is multi-factor authentication. It used to be that you could just put in a password, Jonathan. That's your password, right? Yeah, bad idea. Now, algorithms make it harder. You have to have characters. And also, multi-factor authentication. A code will go to your phone. It will be on your phone for just a minute. You enter it in, and that enables you to gain access. This is a great way to try and secure the cloud. So they're doing a whole bunch of other things to secure cyberspace. That's just two. Now, below them, you see the internet service providers. They also do a lot. One thing that I'll flag, they can scan malicious code. If they have malicious code that they know is bad, they can watch out for it and prevent it from getting onto systems. That's something very important that they do. And below them, you see two companies. Now, the cybersecurity managed service market. This is growing in leaps and bounds. 
venture capital companies are investing, IT companies are investing, and then acquiring the capabilities from the cybersecurity service industry. There's a whole bunch around the world that are doing great work. I'll just name two. The first is Palo Alto Networks. They have something called a next generation firewall that they'll put on the system, and it observes all the applications on your system to see if there's any anomalies that are going on, such that they can then prevent something from happening. They work very closely with another company called Tanium. Tanium provides endpoint security solutions. You cannot secure your network if you don't know how many locks you have in the house, how many outhouses, how many apartments. Tanium allows you to identify all the assets on your network and then visualize their status through a visualization tool. It's great. What about for the least among us? For those who can't afford cybersecurity? For human rights activists, dissidents, and lawyers all over the world who live in oppressive regimes, who are under digital attack by their own government, Jigsaw provides capabilities. You can apply and Jigsaw will help. That's great. And in one of the more recent developments, the chat WhatsApp, they now have encrypted chat and call capabilities. This is tremendous. If you're in Syria trying to flee the Syrian regime, you can have an encrypted conversation with a reporter, as recently happened, describing what's going on in your life. So these are, this last piece is not about destructive capabilities. This is about preserving your way of life. Right? Okay, so this is, some of, this is a little bit of a portrait of the technology landscape, but let's take a big step back. What's the most important part of our cybersecurity story? Sure, we have to deploy these technologies, but the most impart, important part of the cybersecurity story, that's us. This is a management and leadership problem before it becomes a technology problem. So what does that mean for all of us as we think about the future to, for, how to, for how to arrive in that second world of a more secure future. First, every organization needs a cybersecurity strategy. You need to think about your interests, your missions, your operations, and how they interact with data. Once you have a sense for how data dependent you are and where that data is, you then need to assign resources, people, technology, and processes to secure that data. A strategy can help you do that. You can set objectives, you can set deadlines, you can move forward. That's what we did in the Pentagon. Our 2015 strategy was very explicit about dates, times, and deliverables. That drives change. That helps you assign people and resources to the problem. The second thing, as a part of your strategy, you need to get the basics right. Basics are very important. These cyber basics allow you to make significant change. So leaders can set the tone in their strategy for how to meet the basics. Let me just give you one example. One of the attacks that I just described, um, all the passwords were in a folder marked passwords, right? The password to gain access to that system, wait for it, password, right? That's not okay. It's just not. So you have to, leaders have to set the requirements and deliver and make it, make it punishable if you're not following good passwords. But with the basics, you can block about 90% of what might get through. The third recommendation is government and the private sector must work together. There have to be forums for collaboration. The private sector, by investing in some of the capabilities that I've talked about, like intrusion detection systems, passwords, you can block 90% of what might get through. But in those instances where an attack breaks through the system and causes significant damage, the private sector cannot hack back against another country. That's a way to initiate World War III or at least a significant international misunderstanding that's gonna cost money and potentially lives. Governments and the private sector need to communicate and government needs to be the only one who can respond. You can respond with indictments, you can respond with sanctions, like in the North Korean example, or otherwise. The fourth, we need to plan for resilience. You need to assume that the enemy is gonna cross the moat, break into the castle, and get close to the crown jewels. What does that mean? For the military, it's meant that to fly our planes and ships, the military has had to assume that you will operate in a cyber-degraded environment where you won't have access to communications. You still have to deliver. So other organizations, private organizations, have to develop business continuity plans that allow you to, develop, to deliver your most important capabilities even without assured access. Now, after everything you've done, after all we've done to protect our data, we now live in a world where you don't need massive armies to strike. A small group of people can turn planes into missiles. You can turn ones and zeros into malicious code. So after you've done everything you can, it's time maybe to put down your phones, get off your computers, be with one another, read poetry, 
because our social bonds cannot be hacked. Our best defense against high consequence risks is one another. Thank you very much. <laughs>